Hey, welcome to Performance Anxiety, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. I am your host, Mark. And before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, AKG, for sending us their Podcaster Essentials Kit. It's got an amazing Lira mic and the most comfortable set of headphones you ever tried. If you guys have ever thought about starting your own podcast, this is the easiest, most affordable way to get started with high quality gear. Now, I've mentioned this list I made early on of unicorn guests. Well, today I get to check another one off the list. Rob Marshall is one of the most incredible people I've had on this show. He's an amazing guitarist, but more importantly, he's a great human. He began making wall of sound music with Lice Asleep and Exit Calm. When that period ended, he began writing for and with Mark Lanigan, culminating in his project called Humanist. And that album is a masterpiece. If you haven't heard it, stop this podcast and listen to it. Seriously. I get some great behind the scenes stories of how it all came together, like how the centerpiece of the album is a nine minute improv with John Robb and his otherworldly vocals. Follow Rob at Humanist on social media. Follow us at Performance ANX. Support us with a cup of coffee at ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety. Merch is at performanceanx.threadless.com. And now I'm truly honored to welcome Rob Marshall to Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network. I'll just keep it brief then. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, all right. And here we go. Uh, hi, this is Rob Marshall from Humanist, and you're listening to Performance Anxiety with Mark Shea and me. Uh, it's uh, Shea. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. Well, you got your mistake. I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man, I'll do it again. Um, cool. All right. <clears throat> Hi, this is Rob Marshall from Humanist, and you're listening to Performance Anxiety with Mark Shear and me. Well, I, I think a long time ago I sent you a link to the show, and uh, so I don't know if you ever had a chance to check any of them out, but what one of the yeah, things... Yeah, man, I've, I've listened to quite a few, actually. Obviously, the, the Lanigan one and uh, awesome. Ian Ottawa, he, he can tell a good story, can't he? Oh, my God, yeah. I, I, the only thing I, I wish I could have gotten a little better of a connection audio wise with him because it was it was a little on the rough side f uh, for what i like but it was great the content was amazing and i love that guy to death no he, he seems like a good guy i've had a bit of back and forth with him uh messages and whatnot but yeah oh, never met him but he seems like a cool dude he's awesome in fact it's funny because um out of i've had a you know i've dropped i think 170 episodes and oh wow Oh. Yeah, and and the one person that oh, that keeps coming up to have on is you. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not oh, kidding. Man. Well, I uh, I'll apologize now for uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, he, I, I don't know why. Who? Who's, oh, uh, uh, well, the Ian Ottawa for sure. Mark Lanigan. Right. He was definitely. Uh, yeah. He was one that that said I had to get you on. Um, oh, man, I'm thinking nice. Alan Johannes may have brought you up as well but i know leah and peter from black rebel motorcycle club were adamant that i try to get you on oh uh, they're good people man that's uh, kind of a yeah. i love the death i mean I'm, I'm i'm honestly i talk with uh message with ian just about every day uh, in, well, so. <laughs> in some way or another it's, it's just crazy but i love that guy he's he's uh he's hilarious yeah, man. I, I, that's, I, the first time I heard of him actually was um, when the video popped up with Bart Lanigan, the duet that they did. Yeah, uh, I'm always. And then, uh, yeah, that's it, man. And then, um, I, that, that, then he got in touch, and I was speaking to him a little bit, uh, and I, I mentioned him to Mark, and he was like, "Oh, yeah, he's a really cool guy. I've like known him for, since he was a kid or something." I think, yeah, for years. So. I've, I've got a list of people that are like my dream guests and you may actually be kind of surprised that you were on that list. Oh, oh, but man. <laughs> seriously, because I've been a huge fan since Exit Calm and... Oh, oh fucking hell. Yeah, and I, oh, I, thanks. I, I've been trying to follow follow your work and it, over here in the States, it's, it's not as easy sometimes. I mean, the internet makes it a little easier, I guess, but, but uh, yeah. also, you know, three kids 
full-time job. It makes it a little difficult to find some people sometimes, but I've been trying to follow you ever since. And, and seeing that you had done the Gargoyle album with Lanigan, I'm like, oh, okay, okay I got to, this is, this is fantastic. So when I started doing this podcast, I made a list and, and I thought Lanigan, Alan Johannes, you, um, oh, Black Rebel Motorcycle Club. So I, and I, so I've actually been able to hit a whole bunch of them. So this is just another check on my list. So, uh, uh, thanks, man. Well, then Black Re- I mean, Black Rebels are a great band. In fact, start years back over here, they used to have uh, in HMV and Virgin, you used to have listening posts um, where you could albums would come out, and you you could listen to the latest record or whatever that was just being released. Oh, and, nice. uh, I remember the uh, when the Black Rebels first album came out. The first day it came out, I was just happened to stumble into a, into HMV or something. I was listening to the album. I actually bought it on the day that. Uh, it was released the first record, so wow. I've kind of been following them really for quite some time. So it's nice to be in touch with them now. They were a fucking great band, though. They were always like a great live band as well, weren't yes. they? Yes, I've I got lucky enough. I've seen them, th- I think, three or four times, and that's probably the most I've seen any band. I think, I think that I've seen two bands four times. I've seen a lot of shows, but usually it's just like one band, and then I don't know. I just I, I don't move on, but you know. I, I like to see a lot of different bands and I have, I have limited funds. So I got to be careful who I, who I go see. So, uh, I've seen rush four times and I've seen wow. black rebel motorcycle club four times. And that's the, the, the two top ones for me. I, you know, I don't think I ever stopped. I've probably seen them four or five times as well, but you know, at festivals as well, but, yeah. not, but I don't think I ever saw them with Leah. I think uh-huh. it was every time it was with, um, with Nick. Uh, yeah, Nick Jago, that's it, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, man, it's been a while because I've only seen him with Leah. So, and, and right. Okay. I when, I, when they first, okay. So we'll eventually get into the podcast, but I, <laughs> it's kind of what I like doing anyway. So, no, but, it's good. It's free, free, free call, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Good, yeah. So my brother was, uh, uh, my brother's a weird guy. I love him to death, but his musical taste just, it's he's like a roller coaster. The one steady with him is like fifties and sixties music. He's a huge fan of of doo-wop and then into sixties like psychedelia and and big Neil Young fan and all that. And when he got to college, and I guess a little after college, he got a, a, in, into a little more alternative stuff. So this was like the late nineties and all. And one day. He was, I was living in Alabama at the time and he was at, up at University of Alabama and I was living like three hours south, like just off the Florida border. So I was real close to the Gulf of Mexico. So he drives down to visit and he brings the first BRMC album. And I'm listening, cool. I'm like, this is incredible. This, uh, uh, this is amazing. This is the sound I've wanted to hear for a long time. <laughs> and so, I mean, he loves it too. And, he, he doesn't leave it with me no matter how much I beg him and because uh, where I was living in Alabama was pretty rural and it, was, it was hard to get good music there you know the one record store in town didn't have a huge variety it was mostly like Limp Biscuit and then Country so oh Christ exactly so <laughs> so I, I I go there and I, I can't find it so I end up ordering it and and, getting, and that was the beginning of, of the obsession and I it's funny because their second album lost me a little bit. I didn't, I wasn't a huge fan of take them on on their own. And then Howl right. came out and I did, did, I just became re obsessed with everything. And my brother totally forgot about the band. He was like, wow, he loved it. But then he, he moved on and just kind of forgot about it. And I started talking about how their, their Howl was great. And he's like, wait, wait, who's this I'm like black Rebel motorcycle club? He's like, do I know them? I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> I used to respect you. <laughs> but, yeah, that was a huge departure, wasn't it, that record? It was a surprise when it came out, but they, they did it really, that kind of style really, really well, man. I, yeah. Even the artwork looked like a like a you know an album from the mid to late sixties. It in I can't remember what, what what does the artwork look like? Uh it's uh, uh, it's it's like a almost like a collage. It, it, I mean, it depends. If you go, if you take, if you open the gatefold and you, and you turn the, the back, it's like a collage. Like uh, there's like pictures right. of them hanging out out in the studio. There's pictures in the studio. It wasn't just artwork. It was you know 
I don't know, it, it just the typeface. It looked like an old Marty Robbins album or something. Right. Okay. And I, and that really drew me in. I'm, and, and cause I was, I was debating about getting it. I'm like, I wasn't a huge fan of their second album, but this, uh, this, uh, this artwork kind of drawn me cause I used to be a photographer. So it, that kind of right. stuff draws me in. And, and so I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm going to get it. I'm going to splurge. I'm going to get it. And I was just blown away. I, they just pulled me right back in. Shit, man. Wow. But I remember, I mean, going back in the early noughties, I used to just buy albums and the cover looks fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> if I was I, in London, just kind of wandering around, going to a, <laughs> a, a record shop or whatever, and if the if the cover looked good I, and then and it kind of had a good feel about it, I thought, oh, fuck it, I'll just give it, you know, buy a few records like that, just because uh, you never know, do you? Yeah. I used to do that. When Some I... of those things that you just you go back, you don't really, you, you don't kind of click with them at the time, but then you kind of discover, rediscover that you had the record like ten years later or something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're like, fuck, man, how did I get hold of that record? Exactly, so, I know exactly what you mean. I, yeah. I used to do that a lot when uh, before I got married um, and we had kids, but uh, we had this close to my house. We had this record shop, and it was close to Princeton University when I, I lived in New Jersey at this time. I, I moved up and down the East Coast. Oh, I say, like a gypsy. Yeah, right. pretty much. <laughs> I've, been in, I've been in Virginia for 14 years and I, I feel like I got to move now. I've been long, <laughs> this is the longest I've ever lived in one place. But um, Oh, some, something must be wrong. Uh, yeah, well, I got kids now. They, they were all born in Alabama and we moved them up here, but they've, they've, uh, they've started school here, so I'm going to keep them here. Yeah, but that's it. I mean, family changes everything, doesn't it? Sorry, continue on. It does. Oh, no, no problem. Um, There was this record store called the Princeton Record Exchange, and they would get all kinds of promos from the college radio station. And so they'd had literally had thousands of UCDs and a bunch of them were record store, record station promos. And so you could buy new albums and sometimes promos before the album was released for like a two dollars. And wow. So, yeah. So me and my buddy Ed would drive down to the record store with like fifty bucks in our pockets and come back with twenty albums. And, oh wow! And we're like, all right, well, let's start <laughs> going through these and just and and that was what we did on the weekends, just buying new music and and you know whether it was a band we knew. And I was so this kind of ties into you. I was obsessive about the bands that I like. And the people involved in them. So I would, let's say, we'll use Exit Calm for an example. I would get the album. I would read the liner notes. I would find the bands that you guys would thank in the liner notes and start hunting them out. But I would also look up the members of the band and start looking at other things that you guys were involved in. Uh, right. Okay. And that's how I found some of my favorite bands. At, like, uh, you know, Mark, wow. the band Mark was in, uh, Mad Season. You know, I, oh, I was yeah. a huge Pearl Jam fan for their first two albums. After when Vitology came out, I they I lost Pearl Jam. They just I don't know. Pearl Jam to me shouldn't be a punk band. And they shouldn't try to be a punk band. And then they <laughs> when they did that with Vitology, I'm like I'm because I'm not a big punk fan. But Mike McCready, I loved his guitar playing. So anything he was involved in, I would go pick out. And that's how I found Mad Season. And you know, and Mark Landing was, and I was like, oh, so this has got Mike McCready. Lane Staley and Mark Lanigan. Beautiful. Wow. And Barrett Martin. Yeah. So so that's that's how I have kind of kept up with your work is because I loved the guitar sound that you had in Exit Calm so much that I'm like, I gotta find everything that, that Rob's doing because wow, I love you. this sound. But thank you very much. Man. Before we, we go into Exit Calm and Humanist and what you're what you're doing now, what I like to find out is how you got there in the first place. So what got you into music in the first place? I know from doing a little bit of research that you grew up listening to Beatles and Wurzel Gummidge. <laughs> So, uh, no. So, <laughs> Where did you read that? <laughs> I read. I, I I read an interview. Uh, um, oh. And if you, oh, maybe that. What uh, was that? Uh, <laughs> some inter, an, an exit car interview or something. Uh, like I be, actually, I think it was a. It may have been a like a sleep interview. Where oh, oh, somebody yeah. somebody asked you what was the first album you ever got, and you're like, I'm a little bit embarrassed, but I think it was Wurzel Gummidge. 
Oh, no, I don't. I, I was probably, <laughs> you know. <laughs> not, yeah, I don't know. It, <laughs> it's a long time ago. It, that. That's okay. My my first <laughs> album that I remember ever having was Disco Mickey Mouse. I got it for Christmas one year. So, it, you know, it's cool. Wow. No, I definitely had the uh, the Jungle Book. I mean, when I was about three, I remember that. Um, yeah. But no, I, the, the, the music that um, I grew up with, I guess, was um, things, well, my, my mom and dad were, Really, like they loved Elvis Presley, so that was kind of that was played a lot. Okay. Uh, Roy Orbison, Every Brothers, Billy Fury, oh. not really any Beatles or weirdly. Oh, really? Yeah, they weren't really big Beatles heads. Um, they were more kind of like leaned on the Stones side wow. of things, but and more town and and things like that. Yeah, oh, nice. And we kind of I I grew up in a little town. <laughs> Called Eaglescliff, just in a place called Stockton and Tees in north east of England. Okay. Little kind of terrace, two up, two down. Um, we had a, I remember we had like a record player with the speakers, you know, that all kind of all in one thing. I can't remember what the, the uh, console sta- started. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of, it, it, every weekend it, that would go on. It didn't seem to, it's like it, it wasn't allowed to go on through the week or something. I don't know why, <laughs> but on weekends, the records came out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, so I kind of grew up listening to that, really. And then, obviously, the like later days, my, I was probably influenced by the things that my brother was listening to, her older brother. Um, okay. And he was kind of, like, got me into, he had, like, cassette tapes, a screen with Delica and Stone Roses, Massive Attack, that kind of thing. Oh, so, nice. So that kind of is probably where, you know, things really started to... Well, I really started to get into music, probably. But um, you know, I don't. Know, when I was a kid, I don't know. It was it, music was like a, like a, a mystical thing, wasn't it? It was like another world. It, it wasn't. It's not the same now because the, you've got the internet and and I don't know, man. It was like back then the TV and the radio. They were quite. When the TV went on, every, the, everybody sat around it. Yeah. And with music, you kind of sat and listened to it. It wasn't something that was so much in the background in our house anyway i don't know i've had that discussion with so many people about how music has almost been cheapened in the fact that you have such easy access to it now legally and illegally and you just put it on in the background to do other stuff with yeah, it's not the same, and you don't, you know. I mean, it's a pretty obvious sin because it's. I, I, I'm guilty of it myself, but you don't. People don't really listen to records anymore, no. fully start to finish. You know, it's we just you kind of like randomly pick out tracks, don't you? It's, uh, yeah, well, it's a bit sad, really. But. Spotify and streaming services really have a. Uh, I think they've got a big hand in that because I I've got free Spotify. I, I'm not going to pay that. You know, whatever it is yet. I still have three kids at the house. I got to pay for college coming up and, and all. So, you know, every little bit I got to save. So I don't, I, I'm just using the free Spotify. So I can only listen to a certain number of songs in my playlist that I want. And then it just randomly picks its own stuff. And so, right, okay. and so I can't listen to it. If I'm streaming something I, in the car or, you know, doing what I just said, I can't stand having it in the background for something else. I can't just listen to an album back and forth unless I've downloaded it on my phone and killed all my memory. You oh know, man! Then so so now I'm just kind of you know. At you the, you uh, need to get an iPod then. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to go back to the iPod. I do. You know what? I had a, disc. I I had one and it broke. I was using it up to a couple of years ago and then it finally died on me. I I may oh, need to go man. back and do that. <laughs> yeah, man. If I can find something to to upload it with, I got a. I, I bought a new laptop. Well, my wife bought me a new laptop for the podcast for my birthday last year and it doesn't even have a disc player in it oh shit man and i need what is it the uh, the air mac is it or it's no no it's a dell all right but oh, it's man. What? It, it has no disc player and, and i'm a guy i need the physical copies like i was telling you a couple of days ago i've you know i've streamed humanist for a long time but i i haven't been able to get a physical copy yet and you know, well, they, they're doing uh, the the vinyl sold out, and they're doing uh, the label are doing another rerun. Uh, so when they do, I'll send you a copy in the post. Oh man, you're amazing. No That's worries, man. So I, we got the Spotify rant out because I, I tend to, I like every other show I end up doing that for because we all, I, everybody seems to have the same opinion. Music just isn't what it used to be. I mean, the, the music is still great, but people don't value it the way they used to. So. 
No, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a funny time, isn't it? Yeah. Know, hopefully, something. I mean, uh, do you buy do you buy records still? Like I, seriously, I, yeah, seriously, I buy. Um, uh, if I find something I like, I buy it on on. I'm a CD guy, just because I've you know I, when I was in my late teens, early twenties, CDs were the the big thing, and they're more portable than records. So I would have a CD player in the car, and I would just take a handful of discs and stick them in my car. And, so I'm still into CDs. I like the size of the albums being a photographer i like art and so i like the size of the lps but i if i get an lp it's more for collectible right uh, well, you know i've got a humanist cd yeah just uh send me your address after the after this and i'll, and I'll get one sent sent over to you oh man you're the best thank you yeah. so much no worries man oh man oh uh, okay so yeah so i do i i do get I love cds in fact with some of the uh, PR people that that send me artists to do, have on the podcast, they I actually request them to send me promo CDs if they can because I I love having the physical physical copy. I don't feel like I own whether you know whether it's a promo or if I actually go ahead and buy it myself. I don't feel like I've owned I own it if if I don't have a physical copy. I'm always afraid of files getting corrupted and having to re-download something or uh, having to prove that I bought it in the first place. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. So I'm a physical guy. I'm a tactile guy. I need to to own it. So, oh, I, me too, man. Yeah. so did you start off with guitar, or was there an, another instrument that that really pulled you into playing music? Uh, no, it, no, it was the guitar. Yeah, but I mean, I guess going back to the, the um, kind of old, old school. I mean, I didn't know anybody that played guitar, so it was something that was untouchable. It was on. Wow. It was on a TV. And it was like, I didn't even think it was something that was attainable until one day I was kind of flicking through a catalogue and I saw a guitar and I was like, fuck. And I think it was like a 150 quid or which is probably about $200 or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, I was, I was probably about 12, 13 and I thought, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a guitar. And, uh, but at the time, my, my parents were quite heavily in debt, I guess we had like uh, people like debt collectors knocking on doors and all that kind of. I've been there. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. And, you know, as kids, you know, I mean, it's just. I guess it was kind of like a heavy time for you know for them, you know, a lot of. Yeah. But, um, so there wasn't much money like kicking around, and I think it was it was we were getting close to Christmas, and uh, I think my mum said like, oh, you know, we've got fifty pounds for Christmas this year or something, you know, and I was like, right, so I've got to get one hundred and fifty. <laughs> so um yeah well, i mean whatever happened we always my mum always made sure that we had our uh, dinner money and uh, yeah. bus money to get to school every day so what i did for about six months is i, I walked to and from school not every day but most days and right. then i wouldn't eat properly i just kind of <laughs> saved my dinner money so I basically wow. saved up all my yeah <laughs> got my, i've got this money together so when i, I you know Combine that with the Christmas money and bought myself a guitar, yeah, and that was it, really. Wow. <laughs> Cause, uh, yeah, and then everything went downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah. So, what was your first band experience like? I mean, I know Like Asleep is the first thing I know about. Were there, were there other bands before that, or were you? Just... No, that that was the kind of. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I did. So when I when I first got the guitar, I got a friend that bought guitar as well. So there was like two of us together. So we kind of like we did you know a group of friends. We got together in somebody's garage and we were kind of like tried to do like a little band thing, but it was just like nothing. It was like crap, you know what I mean? And then yes, I know what you mean. Um, on that. <laughs> and then I ended up uh, through circumstances. Just I kind of fumbled around a little bit for uh, when I left school, did some crappy jobs, and then um, I one day kind of through circumstances, the family home that I was living in was kind of being sold, so I ended up making the decision to jump on a bus, a National Express, and went to L London. I had a friend that lived down there, okay, and uh, I was about eighteen, and yeah i had a contact down there for some guy it was a music management company if i remember right called sharp music and i think i recorded a couple of kind of like crappy four track demo things or whatever mm -hmm. and he was interested in me do you remember a channel called eurosport yes yes i do 
Well, he was kind of interested. He had some weird, like some contact, and he wanted me to write instrumental music for this channel, Eurosport. Like, you know, like, I guess what oh, wow. they call these days library music. But, uh, yeah, so I went down to London and kind of was going to pursue that. I was down there for a few months and somehow ended up in Sheffield, and that's where I kind of ended up settling and, and Lice of Sleep was formed there, so... Oh wow! But that was the first kind of serious band, I guess that was in. Okay, okay. So had, had you been playing out at all in in front of the public before, like asleep? Then, or was, was it just no? That was, garage yeah, that, yeah, that was that was the first the first time I, I went. Wow. I it was one of the, I kind of went into a shop and there were, I saw you know they have those adverts for people looking for guitar players. I yeah. thought oh, I'm going to stick around in in Sheffield, which. Uh, I was there for about 12 years. So it was probably about the first month I was there. And uh, I saw a thing on a wall that said kind of influences Pink Floyd, Doors, Jeff Buckley. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. I phoned them up there and being the, the singer for Lice Asleep. And he was like, oh, we've already got a guitar player, but uh, we've got a gig tonight to so come down. So I went down. Mm-hmm. Um, watched them play. And so speaking to Dan afterwards, I didn't think much, and I, I, I don't know why, but he kind of must have liked the way that I was talking or whatever, and he was like, why don't you come to a rehearsal? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, a bit odd. <laughs> <That's> weird. <laughs> yeah, so I turned off at this rehearsal, and everybody quit. <laughs> so that was <laughs> 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 <What? laughs> So that didn't go That's too not well. a good start. Yeah, so... Yeah, no, I don't, no, it wasn't as bad as that. So I was essentially the kind of ba- the bass player and the guitar player ended up leaving, and um, and the singer and the drummer they were like, well, we want we want to do a band, we want to be in a band with you. <laughs> so that kind of was the, that was Scott. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. And so that was uh, that was Scott and that was Dan and they so Scott Hampton, who was the drummer in Exit Calm as well. And yeah, that, I guess that was the birth of Lice Asleep. And then we advertised for a for a bass player and, and Simon came along and, and off we went. Yeah. So I've been and pronouncing we, that wrong the entire time then. Everybody did. I mean, we it, it, it was we, we had Lycra, like, li, Lice, <laughs> like, a, like a sheep. Like a sheep. Oh <laughs> yeah. my God. It, it's, it's just, it was the worst fucking name ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we got we were stuck with it because you know once you choose these things it's like ah oh, man it's so bad but right. um, terrible but um, yeah so we, we, I can't try to think uh, anything interesting in my life so, I mean like, essentially we kind of we did it the old school way we kind of slogged around in loads and loads of gigs okay uh, you know just literally anywhere and everywhere that you know, across the country. Was it mostly and original then, tracks or were you, were you... Oh, no, it was, yeah, everything. that was all, oh, yeah, okay. only original. And, uh, oh, nice. We were kind of like pretty, pretty, pretty out there, really. I guess we had that verb tag, like even yeah. back then, that you know, because of the kind of atmospheric big big guitars, I think. Yeah, the big swells of of psychedelic guitar, and that's honestly, I mean, that's what drew me into Exit Calm, and then Lice Asleep afterwards, because that went backwards, and um, this the sound is uh, musically is, is pretty similar between the two bands. It's it's dense but delicate, and uh, what I found interesting was that. Uh, I read a quote from a promoter about Lice Asleep saying uh, they called it music to commit suicide to. <laughs> well, I've never heard that. Oh, you know. yeah. That was... That's probably about right. Yeah. See, I, I, I would say heavily <laughs> atmospheric, but I, I wouldn't say suicidal. I mean, geez. No. That's a little uh, rough. Yeah, yeah well. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. 
But you guys, yeah. You, but yeah, now I, in my research, I found that five. I found five tracks that got released in some way, shape, or form. I mean, is there was there a lot more that never got released? Yeah, we, there, there was a quite. There was quite a bit more. We were kind of we were working towards a record, and then the last, very last thing that we did was this about a month of dates with a band called Pure Reason Revolution. And we, there was kind of, we were already at that point, really, uh, the three of us kind of moving away from the singer, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Dan's like lo- a lovely guy, you know. It was, yeah. But it was just uh, musical differences, I guess, you know. Okay. He wanted to do his own thing, and uh, we were kind of going in a different, slightly different direction. But, um, I, yeah, we, we, we had somehow a tape... Was it a tape? Yeah, I guess it might have been a... No, a CD. It'll have been a CD, yeah. Got into the hands of Alan McGee. Oh, through wow. a promoter. Uh, do you know from Creation Records? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he ended up putting... There was a night that he had on in uh, London called uh, Notting Hill Arts Centre. I think it was just called Alan McGee's Notting Hill Arts Centre. or some, some crap like that. Um, <laughs> and he, he put us on there. And then we met our first manager, John Bryce, who was looking after a band called South. They were signed to Morwax, which is James LaBelle's label. And that oh. was kind of the, I guess that's because we had that, that kept us going for quite a bit, you know, because then we started putting out a couple of, we, well, we put out a couple of seven inch records. Yeah. Um, but yeah, by the time we got to that, to that tour, I think it was just kind of game over really, you know, we were just kind of going through the motions. And then when that split, we kind of dusted ourselves down. Yeah. advertised for a singer and then we met Nikki and, and that was that you know we're off we're off again really and, and I, I, can, I think Exit Cam was a more focused but definitely a more focused version of what Liza Slate was trying to be and you had a chance to change your name oh thank god yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so something did, slightly better yeah exactly so how did you guys <laughs> choose Exit Calm because that's that's an intriguing name oh man that that, that came from the bass um, I think it came from the bass player and I'm I'm not really sure to be honest with you, but um, it was Blind yeah. Shore for a little while, right? Yeah, well, that was through a band in Texas that we liked uh, called Seven Percent Solution. Okay, uh, they were kind of a psychedelic band, I guess. That they really they weren't very big or anything, and they had a track called Blind Shore that we thought was pretty cool. I think we got in touch with the guy and we're like. Do you mind if we use? And he was like, "Oh, I've got a band called Blind Show, so we didn't end up, you know, using that name." But I think Exit Calm was better anyway. I quite like like the the sound of it, and I like the way it looked written down. I I like Exit Calm. Blind Shore sounds. I mean, it sounds like something from the early nineties. Yeah, it sounds a little bit indie, doesn't it? It's yeah, a bit, a bit light light indie. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, all right. So, how did you guys find the new singer, Nikki Smith? Uh, I just advertising again. I think it was in a music music shop we advertised we put I, I, he'd heard of our band before actually okay um so i think he thought when he read the uh, um the advertisement that it might be us and then when he, i think he might have sent a demo tape or something to the bass player and as soon as i heard his voice i was like fuck man yeah, yeah. definitely he's got a wicked voice great great singer oh, had man. a great presence the thing that that kind of blew me away was that the sound I mean, I I loved this the music of Exit Calm, and the very first time I heard it, I'm listening to the to the you know you've got it all wrong is the first song I heard, and uh, so yeah, fine. I'm listening to the guitar and the bass and the, the music, and it's just swelling up, and it's reminding me of early Verve. It's like you you you've taken Nick McCabe and just distilled him down to everything I love about him. And you're oh, playing that. Thanks. And it, so mentally I'm expecting a dreamy Richard Ashcroft type of vocal maybe. And then all of a sudden Nikki Smith comes in with this, like Paul Rogers meets Lemmy kind of vocal. And I'm like, Holy crap. This is not what I was expecting at all. This is amazing. Between the 
the music that I love and the unexpected heaviness and gruffness of Nikki's vocal, I was hooked. Yeah, that, that, that's what was I thought was great about our band, actually, is that with Lice Asleep, um, Dan's a, like, an amazing vocalist as well, but he kind of like sat on top of the music and floated around it. And it was yeah. pretty kind of ob- obvious of what you'd expect, but Nikki kind of went against what we were doing and kind of at the same time made it more accessible, I think, because we were trying to focus the sounds a bit more. Okay. When we came out of to Sleep in the music that we started to write in the room. But with Nicky, he made it even more focused because he was such good at writing really hooky melodies. And so it felt like a real step up for us from Lights to Sleep to that. You know, and, yeah. it was, uh, and it was. So did you start from scratch with Exit Calm or were you, did you have music already set that, that Nicky could sing over? Well, uh, we um, probably had about six, six or seven tracks that we were kind of like playing around in the room before Nikki had got there. Okay. But then obviously once Nikki was there, there was, we, you know, you, you changed things around and, yeah. and whatnot, but yeah, yeah, pretty much, you know, we, we had a bunch of ideas there, but then over the course of like the two years, we kind of, we did loads and loads of playing again, uh, loads of writing. We were never, you know, we were just in the, in the rehearsal rooms like all the time. Yeah. And then there was like a turning point, I guess, when we, we went to, we just, a lot of people were kind of sniffing around us at the time. We did this gig in London, I think it was at the Water Rats. It was probably the first time we ever sold out a gig in London. And wow. there was like labels and agents and managers there. And it was just kind of like, you could just feel that something was in, that happening. Do you know what I mean? And when you're in bands, you feel those little points where there's like little kind of possible turning points where it could something could go. Do you know what I mean? And there's a, there's... Yeah, I, I, not you know, not being in a signed band, I I understand what you're saying, but because I've it, other things have happened that like that in other areas of of life for, for me, fortunately. But yeah, I, I I know exactly what you're saying. It's it's got that's got to be a crazy feeling though, knowing that there's there's a you're on stage yeah, and there's like, a possibility in that somewhere in that crowd something's happening. Yeah, you you just get a fe- you just get a feeling. I don't know what it and when we came off after that gig there was um, there was two really big live agents there, the, um Steve Strange from X Ray and uh oh, Steve Zapp, I think it's I T V. Um but anyway, they were kind of like arguing between themselves about who was gonna take <laughs> us on. And then EMI were around us at the time, which we would they were never gonna sign us, but I think because it was they could see that something there was interest there that they was we suddenly went into the we were in and out of their studios in uh, London for quite a bit, uh, just doing demos and stuff. And then yeah, I don't know. Oh, and then we got I guess we got together. We had a so there was managers, but you know, lots of different people interested in us. We ended up going with a guy called John Dawkins that was looking after. He he looked after the enemy. Uh, I don't know if you'd heard of the enemy in America. You probably haven't, no. but they were kind of like, they had a time over here where they were quite big and uh, he just joined forces with Fratelli's manager, Tony McGill. And oh. we liked, yeah, so we kind of ended up getting looked after by them and yeah, I don't know, you know, first album came out and it didn't really happen, I think. I, I think our record was just too fucking out. It was too, <laughs> it, it's not commercial in any way, really, is it? We had a couple of tracks there uh, that were kind of, we did edit so, but the sound was just too kind of uh, too big for radio. I would say. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. But the, 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 one of the cool things that I saw is that the, your de- the debut single, Higher Learning, it sold out on pre-order. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that that was the kind of uh, like the buzzy time. I think you know, like rap, that period that I'm on about with. That. I think we, in fact we did. We recorded those Higher Learning and Awake in um, at EMI Studio just off Oxford Street. Okay, so I want to find out what happened here because Higher Learning came out in February of 08 and then the second single had came out in November of 08, but the LP didn't get released until May of 2010. What was going yeah, on yeah, in yeah. the meantime? 
Well, that, that, we we just we couldn't we couldn't find a label that was a. Uh, I mean, tr- truth be known, that oh, was uh, okay. Yeah, we, 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 it was just a bit of a struggle. I mean, it, I think we were one of like say we were one of those bands that were liked by. We were liked by and respected by other bands, mm. and we were name dropped quite a bit. And there was certainly there was a, a, an interest there, but I think because the, the band was kind of so out there, really musically. I mean, I'm talking like it, we're, we're making twenty minute psychedelic songs, and we're not. You know, right. it's not that out there. Right? But yeah. <laughs> it just, uh, yeah. I don't know why, but it just we just yeah, it just ah. took such a long time okay, know, to get that record, and then we luckily we found a label called AC Thirty owned by Robin and Duncan, and yeah. uh, they really believed in the in the band, and so we put the LP out with. Them, yeah. So. Okay, because to, to me it was sounding like, um, and without digging deep into into labels, it's, it was sounding like there was a uh, some kind of delay between the singles and the album. I didn't realize that that you guys were still hunting for a label at that time. Wow. Yeah, I mean, in fact, our, um, our John, the, um, our manager, he had a bank seat. Oh, so we were wow. for a long time. We would we were like, how the fuck are we? What we're going to do then? We need to get and do this record. You know, we need to go somewhere and record, and. We didn't. Nobody had the funds to do it. Uh, John had this uh, Banksy painting, and he sold the Banksy. Oh wow! And and basically paid for the record himself, yeah, yeah out of his own money. So that that's you know that was quite an incredible kind gesture and what a bold move. I and mean, we what you know forever in debt to to John like for that. It's incredible, really. That's but, um, amazing. Wow. Yeah, it was, yeah it's, and so we ended up in uh, London. Uh, for about a month, I can't remember the name of the studio. To be honest, yeah, we get that detailed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but I loved that album. It's just, oh gosh, it's it's so lush. It's just such a great album. But the next release wasn't for another two and a half years. Uh, were you guys gigging a lot? Were you guys just playing out, or, or were you just taking a a little bit of a uh, of a hiatus? There. Well, again, it's the, I think probably by the time that that first record came out, we'd done a, a lot of support slots with loads of different bands, loads of touring. Yeah. And it kind of didn't, it, you know, I, mean, I think it sold, it sold pretty well, but it didn't really, you know, we weren't making a living out of it, but we treated the band like a full-time job. And yeah. by the time we got to the end, we were just, I think everyone was just a bit tired out of it, really. Um, we tried, uh, you know, maybe at that point, would have been a you know in a way we you know we should have probably split up then but we didn't um <laughs> you, you, you brought up a, an interesting point that I, I don't i don't think about quite often and, I, and i'm sure a lot of people don't think about you've got this album out and you're supporting the album but that's not your full-time job i don't you know that just doesn't i, I think of that if you've got an album out then that's your job yeah, well, it, it was to us for every every, sing, every single member of that band, you know, especially up to that point, we put everything into that record. Yeah. And we were, you know, I guess we were hoping that we might have, you know, we didn't have a publishing deal or anything at that point. And oh. there was no money kind of coming in and, and it was just a real struggle. And, I, you know, you, when you're that committed to a band, and we were, you end, you end up losing a lot of things along the way. And I think by the time we got to the to the end of that record and the end of the year, and it was a case of like, oh, what do we do now? Start writing another record. I think we're all just a bit deflated by it, like, fucking wow. hell. So, but we 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 pushed on, and we ended up getting we parted ways with Dawkins, um, who he parted ways with the guy that he joined a management company with at the time. Oh, I think he was kind of a little bit lost as well at that point. And so we ended up parting ways with him anyway. And luckily we found a new manager and that breathed a little bit of life into the band again for another record, you know, just to get, you know, but it, it just didn't last. I think at that point we'd already started to kind of frictions again within the band and started to kind of come, you know, move forward or whatever. Come, and it just, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, bands have a shelf life, I guess, don't they? Unless you're the yeah. Rolling Stones. <laughs> yeah, oh, God. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's a whole other podcast. So, <laughs> yeah. So then, so the second album comes out, you guys have some friction. You're kind of feeling that it's not going to go any, any further. But a few, a couple other songs did trickle out, like The Veil and Footprints and...
and uh, is there a lot that was left behind that that hasn't seen the light of day? No, not really. There, okay. there, there's about five five new tracks, I think, uh, that we demoed, uh, just did live demos of. And um, but at that point, it, uh, musically, we were we were kind of we were a bit tired out, I think. Yeah. And we were just re- we were just repeating ourselves. I think there was even though the tracks I, I still you know I believed in every th- single piece of music that we ever did, and I put everything into it. But I think by the end we were we weren't really doing anything new. We were just kind of repeating ourselves a little bit, and so you know it, I think it just came to its natural end, really. Yeah. Well, you know it, that, and I think that's part of the problem is that when when you're known for a certain type of s- sound, it, we you, you kind of you, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, you get. Oh uh, yeah. You don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to stifle your creativity by doing the same thing over and over again. You get bored and then burnt out. But then, if you don't do something similar, then much like the issue I had with Pearl Jam's Vitology, you get people like, "This doesn't sound like the band. I don't like this." So you, I know, I, I've done it with bands. You know, so I, I'm. No, I'll read I mean, it, and say I'm sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I, I actually personally I, with the sounds that I was that I had right all the way through Exit Karma, I did begin to feel a little bit stuck, like I couldn't get beyond it. Especially if the three of us were in a rehearsal room, and I was trying to kind of, I always felt like I had to fill gaps, fill like to create this big sound. And if I didn't make yeah. this big sound, and I did try to do something different, everyone was like. I just doesn't sound that good, does it? And as soon as I kind of like, all right, do the old, I fill it out, and everyone's going, oh, that sounds all right, doesn't it? So it's like, yes. fuck it. You know, it's, it's, I, I did feel like creatively, I kind of got, I, I did it to myself, really. I got kind of stuck in this corner where I had to <laughs> try and big guitars, loads of feed, but, you know, just kind of whatever. It's uh, But um, the songwriting is solid, I've got to say, because I listened to a, a an acoustic version of Albion, and that's oh, yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. That's, that's nice of you to say, man. Just yeah. you and Nicky. That's one of my favorites of that. Oh, man. It, it's really, it's beautiful. And that that's a credit to the songwriting. So, it, you know, if you can strip all the noise down and it's still gorgeous with just a voice and one guitar, I mean, that's that's success. Yeah, that, that that's always a, I think that was always a surprise to people, actually, that when we did do acoustic versions or sessions that people were surprised that it still sounded quite big or it still sound, oh, it's actually, you could hear the structure of the tracks yes. and, uh, yeah. And we, we did a, uh, Janice Long, uh, Janice Long session for radio too. me and Nikki. That was quite, yeah. That was, Is that what that was from? We, I don't, uh, I saw it on no, YouTube. we didn't No. Oh, it was on YouTube. Yeah. I, I've not actually heard that. Uh, that, I mean, I've, I, I remember us doing a version of Albion Acoustic, but, um, yeah, no, the Janice Long thing, we did a track called Serenity off the record and a oh, okay. track called Alarms, I think. Might, might have done another track as well, I can't I think, remember. Yeah, I think yeah. I've seen Alarmed, but, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the Albion, it's just, man, that just, just blew my mind. It was just so good. So, Exit Calm, Calls It Quits. You kind of take a little bit of a break, and were you just done with music for at this point? Were you just had you just had enough? Or were you burnt? What was because uh, I, I, I really I, I was burnt from, out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I 14, 14 solid years really of like oh, wow. total full commitment and playing and and when that finished, I was just like, oh man, I'm just like you know. I also just kind of come out of a long term relationship as well mm. and kind of dusting myself off and everything that everything that I had in my life, I think up to that point, had just kind of come to an end. Do you know what I mean? It reached it. So it was kind of, yeah, I, I don't know. I was just, I, I just, I didn't even pick up every single day, probably for 14 years, I picked a guitar up and for about six months, I didn't, I didn't even touch it. I just kind of, wow. it was, just, yeah. And then I just slowly, but surely it just kind of comes, but you know, you, I can't, 
close the door on it. It's there. It's omnipresent all the time. Do you know what I mean? Music, yeah. and it's not like I'd, I'd never listened to any music through that period. I mean, I did, I did, but yeah, I tried to kind of push it away, I think, so but, it, but I just couldn't. The next, the next thing that I found that you got involved with was uh, Mark Lanigan's Gargoyle album, that release right. date-wise anyway. How did you meet up with Mark Lanigan and, and start writing with him? So after about six months, I started writing some music. Um, I started getting into recording myself at home. I just thought, just for fun, really. And then yeah. I kind of got about five or six tracks together. I played them to my manager, and she was like, Oh, these sound really fucking good, Rob. You should do some with them. And then uh, that was the kind of birth, really, at that point of uh, the idea, at least, of Humanist. Okay. So I kind of continued on with that, maybe uh, got a few more tracks together, polished up what I had, and then I wrote down a list of people that wanted to, that I'd like to, would have liked to sing on them, because one thing I didn't want to do is I thought, well, I don't want to get in another band again. And, you know, the idea of standing in a room with, three other people and kind of going through that process. I was like, fuck man, I've just yeah. done it so much at that point anyway. Especially if they, if they're uh, familiar with you and they're thinking you're going to come in with this big wall of sound and that's not what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. I, and, I, and I quite like the idea of just kind of the isolation of being on my alone really, and just kind of working away at things with no pressure or anything. So I got these tracks together and obviously Mark was on the list. So my manager got in touch with his manager and came back saying pretty much actually i think even within like a couple of hours wow came back saying yeah mark's up for it so i was oh, like wow. i even but when that when when that email she, i remember the manager sent to me oh he said yes and i was like nah <laughs> nah <laughs> Man, I, mark is open for so much I, i'm blown away by how open he is to doing things musically and podcastingly i guess so, yeah, we, so we got yeah, I actually we we toured with um Exit Calm that is with Soul Savers. Oh cool. uh, when Mark was singing with Soul Savers. That's all awesome. I never I never met him or spoke to him. I mean I saw him. I mean Yeah. I saw in fact the first time I saw him was in Manchester and he was sat this is before they even sound checked. And he was sat on a couch on his own and he was just like looking down at the floor and I walked that was and I walked past Maybe like two hours later, and he was still in the same position looking at the floor. And I thought, right. <laughs> I was like, right, I think I'm just going to leave that guy too. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm so I did. So that kind of like set the, the presidency really. I did, at that point, I just thought, nah, I'm not going to bother that guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just, uh, but uh, they, they were brilliant gigs. Like, yeah, but then he, when he, yeah, he came back um, saying yes. And then eventually, maybe a couple of weeks later, the tracks came through, the, and the tracks in question were. Uh, Kingdom and Gospel, oh, and man, gospel. I was like, "Fucking hell!" Gospel, it, yeah, it's incredible. Oh, thanks, man. And and we'll come back to all this in in a minute. But the stuff that you get Mark to do, I mean, when I'm listening to Gargoyle and somebody's knocking, I can hear which song is a Rob Marshall song and which song is like an Alan Johannes song. And and there's definitely he approaches them both. Differently, and when you guys, you know, when it, when it's a song written squarely by you and squarely by Alan, you know, it's I can definitely hear the difference. But the stuff that you and Mark do together, I mean, it's and, and all kidding aside, all, you know, this is I'm hundred percent honest with you. The stuff that you guys have done together, it's some of my favorite Lanigan performances over his career. He's, it's, I got hooked into him with Screaming Trees and that crazy you know, baritone he's got, which I'm assuming it's baritone. I don't know. I, I don't know how they classify vocals, but his incredibly deep voice. And then I love what he's done, but for some reason, the, the performances that he, that he does for your music, just, I don't know. He, it, it seems like there's a, 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 something special about it. Something, something a little extra to them. Well, I, well thank you. And I agree. I, 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 when I, I mean, I, the first, I was always blown, well, I was blown away when I heard Kingdom and Gospel the first time. But when I when we started doing the gargoyle stuff, I I remember when I had Nocturne and I thought, right, what became Nocturne? Because he obviously 
named it. Yeah. But I was listening to it and I thought, I fucking know that I've got something like with, with this. It just kind of like, you know, with certain tracks you got, you just know. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. And when he sent back the vocal on that, I was like, fuck. Yeah. That, <laughs> no. One of my, I would say, one of my proudest moments of uh, you know collaborations that I've done. Like, oh, that's it's fucking yeah. I mean, the Beehive. I nearly never sent him it. Yeah, it was it really? was a very last minute. Yeah, which is at that point I got into a habit of writing and recording things, and if I didn't like it, I deleted it. Oh. So I could spend I could spend all day on a track. And if I got right to the end of the day and I listened to it, and I and I didn't feel like it was. Doing doing something that you know, I, I just I get really frustrated and just go fuck it, man. I just deleted it off. And anyway, that was right. So the the beehive thing was right at the back of the pile. And I think I played it to my manager, and she was like, "Are you fucking kidding me? You got to send him that." And then I, so I sent him it. <laughs> and obviously, that was like that was the the radio <laughs> single. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's uh, and the, you know, yeah, it's playlisted and and you know. One of my favorite Lanigan songs from the the past. Oh gosh, since he's gone solo, I, I guess is "Gazing from the Shore." I that oh fuck man, I fuck love, love that wow. song. Oh, I'm glad that you said that. Yeah, fuck. I yeah, I, that yeah, I had a, di- a slightly different version of that track. Um, I mean, a little bit more kind of pill, like Public Image oh, Limited. Yeah, yeah. Like kind of a really like dubbed out reverb bass and oh um, really but yeah that's another that's another one that I think's fucking yeah that I'm really really proud of as well yeah again well, all credit to like, Mark's lyrics are just <laughs> fucking insane aren't they so all right so that's that's another question I've got is are you you you're not writing lyrics for any of this stuff you're you're just sending music out to these uh, singers that you would like to have on the album yeah yeah wow I mean I mean pretty much I mean that the, the lie down. Obviously, is is a track that I sing. I, I'm not massively confident singing or anything like that, and it's not something that I ever I, that I want to do really. But, <laughs> um, so I put it under the the title Madman Butterfly, but that's me. And then the bits like on the end of um, Gospel, that's me, and the backing vocals and, and shit. Wow. But uh, it's really yeah, no, good I, stuff, I, though, man. Oh, thanks, man. I'm proud of that record. Yeah, I'm, yeah it's the first fully you know produced mixed record that i did on um, yeah this album got an achievement it, it got so much positive feedback every you know anytime anybody that i've spoken to about this album they're just like this is incredible i mean i've seen oh god when i had uh the last time i had i've been fortunate enough to have uh leah shapiro and peter hayes on twice and the last time we right. peter and i were just talking about humanist for for a little while it was just he was just oh. blown away, but it literally blew him away. It he was just we talked about it for like ten minutes. Oh, he's a he's a good guy, isn't he, man? It's, uh, they're both lovely, lovely people. Oh, they. In fact, really? I need to yeah, I need to reach out to them. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, the, yeah. I mean, it's it's a, it's a huge compliment, isn't it, when you end up going three sixty with people that you listen to and respect, and then they come back. And it, you know, start listening to you. There's nothing. There's no bigger compliment than that. Oh gosh, I agree. I mean, that's like when I'm lucky enough to have somebody come on this show a, a second time. It means I actually liked being on the first time. So that, I'm like, <laughs> so I kind of get it a little bit. But 
there's more than just you and Mark Lanigan on that. I mean, you've you've got Dave Gahan, uh, Mark Gardner, John Robb, um, Ron Sexsmith. You've got all kinds of people on this album. Yeah, man. It's uh, you should get John Robb on your on the podcast. Actually, he'd be a good one for you. I could hook you up with him if you. Ah, oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, he's a good guy. Well, so, John literally fucking knows everybody. <laughs> uh, interesting guy. That's awesome. Yeah, I would love to talk with him. 